Okay, thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, yeah, this talk is called Design Tokens and You. Uh, thank you, Brent. As Brent said, my name is Max Thorson. I am a senior engineer at Outdoorsy. Um, Outdoorsy is a outdoor travel brand and booking marketplace. We started with uh, a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace for RV, motorhome, camper van rentals, and today we uh, also list cabins, glamping, and even run three physical locations as a part of the Outdoorsy Destination Network. Um, I split this talk into two parts. The first part, I'm just going to try to give a really quick introduction to design systems and specifically design tokens, just to give a little bit of context to the second part of the talk, which is a uh, how we use design tokens in our design system at Outdoorsy called Bonfire, and some of the tools that we built to keep all of our application UI visual styling in sync with our um, sort of source of truth, uh, those, those design systems in a central repo. Um, so, quick introduction about design tokens, and I'm gonna start by talking about design systems. Um, a lot of people I hear kind of interchange design system and component library and just talking about um, a set of reusable components that provide a visual design language. Um, and while that's kind of true, I think that a design system is a little bit of a bigger set of um, design rules and decisions and certainly includes a component library, but also a lot of other decisions that are higher level than that. Um, starting with just things like uh, color palette and typography styles, border radiuses that mean different things, um, different shadows for different uh, sets of in information on a page. And um, in our design system, we even include things like tone of voice when writers are writing content for pages or marketing emails and um, accessibility guidelines. So the design system really is a, is a much bigger um, uh, framework for managing design at scale and uh, by kind of enforcing these rules and creating consistency throughout your entire process you can also increase efficiency and uh, maintainability. Um, this is a screenshot really quickly. I'm going to show our Figma file in a second. Our, at Outdoorsy our design team uses Figma to, to provide um, feature and page designs to the engineering team to be built but they also use it to maintain the design system. And so these are just some, uh, some screen grabs of some of the different um, higher level steps that we took in, in defining our design system before kind of moving into that component level. But um, yeah, obviously like defining things like colors, what do they mean, what are they used for, what are we trying to like explain to the user when we use a certain color, um, typography styles, different shadows, border radiuses, our logo type sets. We have um, other stuff in this file, but I just pulled a few of these out. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll show that Figma file in a little bit to, to get a little bit of a better look at it. Um, another sort of key piece of a design system is documentation. As with any, any uh, application projects, just having really good documentation is, is critical, not just for communicating the system to anyone who might need to know about it, but also having kind of a central place that anyone can point back to and say, we already made this decision, it's right here, I'm not gonna make a new button because you gave me a, you know, a file that has a red button in it when we said in our system the button is green. And so the documentation is really useful. I think as, uh, as UI engineers, it's sometimes easy just to build whatever we're delivered, but uh, we're trying to kind of empower everyone at every step to say, well, that's not what we decided. Let's go back and either change the system or change the design. Um, and then speaking of documentation, the reason why I brought that up, uh, kind of moving into design tokens now, I generally consider a design token to be kind of like a little micro documentation. It's, it's sort of documenting one single design decision into the system and sort of codifying it, the saying, stamping it and just being like, this is what we decided. The primary button color is green. Put it in there. Can't change it. Uh, or you can change it, but <laughs> for all you know, uh, intents and purposes, that's what we decided. That decision is done. 
And so, yeah, what does a design token look like? Um, this is the most simple version of a design token that you can have. There's only two pieces that a design token really needs to, to work and to function, and that is a name and a value. So you could very reasonably just write every design token as a variable in a JavaScript file or whatever language you're working with, um, as long as there's a name and a corresponding value. Um, the naming convention is completely up to your team and how you want to, to uh, name your tokens, but generally uh, you want to have the name something that signifies like what is that value going to be used for or what component does this go on. And so in these three tokens that we have examples of here, um, we're, we're sort of documenting that micro decision to make the primary text color black and the font size of heading level one, 44 pixels. Um, the opacity of a button when you hover it, five per, uh, 0 0.5. So that's the most simple version of a token that you can have. Um, more generally and more often, you'll see tokens in JSON files because they're just uh, easier to parse. And as I'll show in a couple more examples, you can add more metadata around a token when you get into um, get into sort of nested objects and grouping tokens. But um, this is exactly the same example as before. Just now we have a JSON object instead of single variables for each token. Um, in this slightly more uh, spec compliant example, um, the to each token now is not just a value, but is an actually a nested object itself that has a value inside of it in this dollar value property. Um, but we're also now able to include more kind of metadata about each token and, and um, most crucially this type property. Um, you might all see, you know, this hash six zero and know like, oh, that's a hash hex code for black and 44 pixels is obviously a size of something. But once this file is being processed and parsed by any external tool and kind of being formatted into values that can be used by an application code, um, they just see these as strings. And, the, and you could add some kind of regex or uh, you know, any other way to sort of try to pull out the value just based on the string, but why not just add this extra line of metadata that tells these programs exactly what kind of value that they're dealing with. Um, so this is a, a more, like I said, spec compliant. There is, a, there is a spec for design tokens. I'll show that in a second, but um, pretty much this is all they, they define is up to here and this optional description value, which you can just use to um, keep track of like, what, why did we add this token? What is this token for? And maybe the tools you use to process your token files might output uh, documentation also so someone can go read all of those. Um, one more step in kind of making these files even more complicated is this idea of grouping the tokens. And so we saw before all our tokens were just, the names were one top level string with the full name in it. In this example, the names are grouped, or, the, or I'm sorry, the tokens are grouped into nested objects and the names of the token become the path um, of that token within its nested uh, objects. And so we still have a token called color text primary that name is just derived from its path within this object. And the reason why this becomes nice is just, um, again, in, in any tool where you might be processing your tokens or working on, let me output a document that shows all of the text color tokens, it can be nice to have them grouped into similar, um, similar objects. And uh, this probably becomes more important when you're working with component level tokens where maybe your top level um, top level name is button, and then all the tokens under that are tokens that correspond to the button in your, in your component library or in your design system. Then the last example of a token before we start looking at our design system and our kind of custom pipeline is this really powerful feature that I think is kind of what makes these, these design tokens and, and uh, working with um, maintaining them kind of worth it is this idea that you can alias another token in a token. So um, here at the top, we have two, two uh, co text color tokens, primary and secondary, and those just have a hex value hard-coded um, like we saw in the previous examples. 
And then below that, we have uh, a button group that also has some text colors defined. So we might have a primary button and a secondary button, and the text colors on those might be different, but we want them to match what we defined as our design system's high-level primary text colors and secondary text colors. So you can reference other token values in another token value with this curly bracket notation and then the name of that token. And again, here's where that, um, that name is kind of derived from the path of that token in the object. So we have color.text.primary is the name of this token in here, and we're referencing it down here. Um, this example on screen is super basic, but I'll show you our file later on. We have tons and tons of tokens, and um, this becomes really powerful, like I said, when you can define some like more high-level tokens that, that sort of give you these these base values of your system and then reference them lower down in the component level tokens so that when you want to make kind of sweeping changes across your whole system, you only have to change some of those higher level tokens and everything flows down to the component level and more specific tokens. Um, so I embedded the token spec document just to, just to kind of give an example of, yeah, there is a group that's working on um, defining, defining a spec for this, and I know it's been changing a lot, and some of the bigger, bigger tools that are really pushing this idea have been contributing to um, adding new features and more properties to the tokens, but right now it's, yeah, pretty simple stuff, value type description, and, um, and that kind of alias feature is about all we get right now from the spec. Um, so that's just like a quick overview about what design tokens are and how they fit into the greater design system. Um, now, yeah, I want to talk about the projects we did at Outdoorsy, how we use design tokens to, um, well, here, here are the goals that we came up with for this, um, for this project. Uh, the main thing was we wanted a greater visual consistency across all channels. When I started at this company, we had like three Ember apps, a React app, uh, I think we had like a static HTML app, and none, all of those had their own component libraries that weren't connected besides just trying to match them up, um, you know, in CSS or whatever. And um, we were sending communications through email that were 10 years outdated and looked nothing like the website. And so one of the goals the design team came up with was we just, we just wanted everything to look the same. Anytime we're presenting our brand to someone, we want it to look like Outdoorsy brand. And so that was kind of the number one goal of the project. And then um, the design team really wanted reusable components inside their design tools. And uh, they had previously, you know, had separate files for different pages or screens or features, and they might copy and paste a button that they needed in another file to this other file, but then it would get changed just a little bit, and then someone would copy that one, and it would get changed just a little bit. And so like over time, you have all these files that are just disconnected, and they kind of look the same, but some of them are different, or maybe a designer just decides like, in this one place, I'm gonna use this smaller button that we don't use anywhere else. And now that has to get built, and it doesn't look like anything, so. The design team wanted reusable components in the same way that UI engineers have been using reusable components, I think, for a long time, um, but they were not working in that way. And so that was one of their goals. And then, of course, the uh, UI engineers want reusable components as well. And again, that's something that I think everyone is doing nowadays. It's not like a new, um, like a new idea, but we wanted one central um, component library that was definitely lined up to the, the source of truth, which is our design tokens in that central repo. And then the main thing is that we wanted all of this stuff to be connected to the source of truth so that when someone decides that our primary button is no longer green, it's now orange, we don't have to go digging through every code base and every CSS file and every iOS app and Android app and change it everywhere all at the same time. It's all connected and flows from the design tool, which is Figma, where we define the tokens all the way down to the application code bases and just updates. So that was the goal. Um, what we did was we built this pipeline. This is a very crude um, example of what we have, but the, the kind of like big 
bulk of this is in this GitHub repository that stores uh, our, our source of truth for design tokens. So there's one single JSON file in this repo that has every single token that we use in our system. And um, along with a number of other things, some assets that are shared between all applications and, um, and some logic for converting the tokens. And then there's a couple of GitHub Actions workflows that are attached to this repository and run on pushes to the main branch of this repo. The main one is this token transformer action, and this is kind of like the, the meat and potatoes of this whole thing. This action ingests that token file, converts it for every platform that we have. We, we have uh, multiple web apps. Right now, the majority of our apps have been rewritten to React, so we're outputting a React component library. Uh, we have multiple iOS apps and an Android app, and so this token transformer action converts the tokens in that JSON file, which are kind of an arbitrary format. A lot of the values look like CSS, but they may or may not be exactly CSS, and maybe you want to convert pixels into rems or whatever you want to do, but they're definitely not iOS values, and they're definitely not Android values. And so this action converts all of our tokens into a format that will work with all of our code bases, and it pushes them out to those repos in the form of a pull request. So Someone still has to manually review and approve these design token changes into the apps. They're not just deployed straight to production, but, um, but it's generally all, all otherwise automated. Um, we have one other uh, key workflow in that repository, and that's this icon sync action. After we got all the tokens working, we realized that it would be really nice to not have to manually export icons from the design files and in, import them into all the different projects, and so we built a way to um, pull down the Figma file that contains all of the icons in our system, parse it, um, download all of the icons as SVG, and then include that in the push out to the um, repos. We get them as SVG from Figma, but we can convert them into a few different formats as needed, and I'll show you what we're doing that, or how we're doing that in a second. Um, but all of this is generally triggered from Figma. So in Figma, that's where the design system and the component library are all sort of, they all sort of live there. And we use a plugin called uh, Design Token Studio, which is where we manage, and it kind of gives you a UI for managing your tokens, changing the values, creating new ones, whatever you might need to do. And when you're done modifying the token set, you commit it, and that creates a literal commit to this repo. And so from Figma, the designers modify the tokens, make a commit to the repo, and that sort of kicks off this whole process of converting everything and then pushing it out to the repos. Um, I was going to try to embed a lot of this stuff, but it just got annoying and didn't work very well, so I decided to just um, show some of the code. Um, so yeah, I think the first place that would be good to look is at the Figma file, like I was talking about. Um, I know most of us are engineers and not designers, but I've been working in here a lot just to get, get this kind of working and set up. Um, so this is a single file we have in Figma that contains a bunch of different pages, and um, this is some of the stuff that we were looking at on that previous screenshot, but kind of starting at that higher level of just defining um, different Colors, here's all of the icons that are part of our, um, all of our apps and anywhere. Uh, we define like some different spacing values and our grid, responsive viewports, um, again like those radiuses and stuff, shadows and typography. And then um, once you get sort of past this level, then we're into the more component library level and um, looking at a button here in Figma. Um, this is kind of what satisfied that designers want was by, by creating all of these pages for each of these different components within Figma, it, it gets a tiny, bit, a tiny bit confusing when I try to explain it because Figma also has this concept of a component that can be reused within a design file. So this is the, the page which defines the, the button component within Figma and then um, in a new file, anywhere else in our in our uh, Figma organization, designers all have access to the Bonfire design system library 
from within Figma. So instead of copying and pasting this button from this file to this file, they open the, the component library in here and they can drag whatever button they need into their design file and this button will update if somebody makes a change to the, to the master component in this file. Um, so that sort of satisfied the designers want to have that reusable component inside of design. And then um, I'm gonna open this plugin for that tokens manager. Um, so this is the plugin that we use to um, manage our design tokens. And you can see even right now it's fetching the tokens from the remote. So it's actually pulling from that GitHub repo to, uh, to, to set up all the initial values of this um, library. Um, on the left side here in this tree, we have these different groups, and these end up becoming groups in that JSON file, just like I showed you early on. Um, anything that's kind of nested inside becomes a nested group or a token eventually inside of a group. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it gives you kind of a nice UI to look at tokens based on their type. We have different color tokens for the button. And then these are connected in Figma, so again, if a designer decided to change this primary button color, they wouldn't go and change it in the Figma panel like they normally would. They would actually come and change the token um, that's associated with that. So if I just come in here, or that's the name, but if I change this value to like a red hex, and hit save, and then apply to page, this should find everywhere on the page that's attached to that particular token and update it, and then, um, and then uh, again, once they publish this component back to the shared library, every file that's using this button in Figma will be, will be updated to reflect that change. Um, once, they're, once the designers are done, they have this little button down here, push to GitHub, it asks them for a commit message. We, we try to ask them to document why they made this change and what it means, but they don't really get that very well. So they usually just say red and then push changes. But that just pushes a commit straight up to that, um, to that GitHub repo. Oh, that's my email. Um, so this is, the, this is the GitHub repo that holds all of, our, um, all of our tokens. Like I said, we have a single file in this tokens folder called tokens.json. And it's very long, 6,790 lines. Um, we have a lot of like sort of core tokens that are just setting up things like literal colors, like a jungle 100 is this green that we use. And that's, that's kind of a literal token where jungle is green. I mean, we could have called it green 100, but um, we're calling it jungle. And then we get into this sort of more um, semantic set of tokens called alias tokens, where we have things like our primary action color for inactive, active, hover states. And um, the reason why we, why we have these alias tokens in between is, let's just say you had a token called green 100, and then on all your buttons you put, you attach the green 100 token. And then next year you decided, all of our buttons we actually want to be red. You could change the value of the green 100 token to be red, but now your green 100 is, value is red, and that's just confusing. So um, with this kind of intermediate layer, you have these tokens that are more semantic in, in their meaning and they kind of explain when and where they should be used. So again, this primary action color hover, we know that we should use that anytime we're working with an uh, action element and we're modifying the hover um, state. And then those tokens alias the, the literal token. So if we wanted to change the value of that primary action color hover state, we would just change this value to whatever it is, and every component below that uses that will pick up that change through the, the power of aliases. Um, so yeah, this is our huge mega tokens file. No one ever looks at this file this way because we just look at it in Figma, so it looks super daunting and like, how do I edit this? But you don't really edit this, you just work with the the plugin that gives you the nice UI, and that commits straight to this file, which kicks off um, those actions like I was talking about before. So a push to this, um, this main branch will trigger this build platform files action. Um, 
let's see if I have that in here for a little bit of an easier way to, to look at it. But essentially, this actions file is going to check out the repo. Oh, one minute. Oh, wow. OK. That goes by super fast. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think maybe then the best thing to talk about is um, Style Dictionary, which is a li open source library at Amazon, kind of sits in, be in between. It does a lot of the lifting of that format conversion. So this is a tool that accepts that JSON file um, according to spec as close as it can be, and then outputs files as you want them to be for each platform that you use. So we spit out a SAS file for web, a Kotlin file for Android, and a Swift file for iOS that has all those tokens converted into values that those platforms would need to be able to compile. So for example, this is the, out, the built Swift file. Obviously, it's like converting colors into some Swift thing that I have no idea about, but um, it works for them. Uh, yeah. Um, wow, yeah, that goes super fast. I guess um, the last thing, yeah, these are what the pull requests look like in the, in the individual application repos. So it gets, they get this automated pull request from Outdoorsy Bot. Um, we can see in this PR that we have changed the, the value of one token. So this SAS file that gets generated for web has a change. Um, these other files are changed just because they change the dates every time they're generated. But um, again, someone would have to review these before they're merged to the code base and actually pushed um, live to production. But um, yeah, 417, OK. <laughs> I keep going back to, to ARC. Um, I guess that's about all I have time for. I had a couple of other, um, a couple of other things in regards to icons and how we set that up, but that's for another time. Yeah. Thank you for coming, everyone. Appreciate Thank you, Max. It. Yeah.